Holy wow, guys, I have not thought about the Rugrats movie in a while. And I'm not talking about the one where they go to Paris or the Wild Thornberrys crossover one. This is the OG Rugrats movie, and guess what? It's a lot darker than you remember it being. I'm Winnie Van Lanningham, and today I'm gonna ruin the Rugrats movie. <laughs> actually starts out super chill. The babies are imagining an epic adventure where Tommy gets to be the cool, tough, but secretly super sensitive hero guy. Bill and Lou get to be gross, and Chucky gets to suck, but like in an endearing way, like Lloyd Dobler or Kevin James. Meanwhile, everyone else is celebrating Dee Dee's baby shower because, surprise, she's pregnant, and surprise, she has friends other than Betty, Howard, Charlotte, and Drew. Like, who the heck is that lady? Or that ponytail guy? My mom would not have let me watch this show if that character was a regular. After a weird baby weight guessing contest that feels a lot more like human trafficking, Dee Dee's parents arrive and Nickelodeon finds every possible way to make sure that you know that they know that Tommy's grandparents are hecka Jewish. In under 30 seconds, they blow through like five different racial stereotypes. But that's another video. What's important for you to remember is that giving someone a goat for a baby shower present is frickin' weird and should be avoided at all costs. After Dee Dee tells her woman friends to stop gender stereotyping her unborn child, we find Stu and Drew Pickles arguing in the basement. If you're anything like me, this is the part of the movie where I completely tuned out when I was younger because there were no dogs and no babies. But as an adult watching this, I was dying to listen to characters who could figure out how to pronounce the word screwdriver properly, so I tuned in. It turns out that Stu and Drew were arguing because Drew doesn't think his little brother makes enough money inventing toys to pay the bills. And Stu thinks that his brother is absolutely right, so shut up. But hang on, you know that meme that went around a while back where Stu's making chocolate pudding in the kitchen at 4 a.m. because he's lost control of his life? It turns out that by the time the Rugrats movie rolled around to the Rugrats TV show timeline, Stu was without savings, a stable income, insurance, and is tasked with taking care of his aging father, wife, two infant sons, and the myriad of random babies that seem to show up at his house like a goddamn nightmare every waking second of every day. Holy crap, dude, that's incredibly bleak. When you're a kid, of course you want to side with Stu. He's a kooky inventor with purple hair who makes toys and likes pudding. What's wrong with that? But when you grow up, it's like, oh no. You're like 35 years old and you blow up your own basement at least twice a week. What are you even doing, dude? Anyways, instead of becoming a pharmaceutical sales rep like my mom wants me to be, Stu tells his brother to heck off and invents the Reptar Wagon, which breathes fire and functions in the event of an aquatic crash. You know, the two major disasters that all toddlers need to prepare vigilantly for. The water landing scene kinda makes sense, but the flamethrowers? Why? Some kid won't share their toy on the playground and Tommy just goes Armageddon on them? Jesus. Anyways, he's hoping to win the big prize, 500 big ones for the best Reptar toy design. Dude, seriously? 500 bucks? That's what's gonna put the Pickles family on Easy Street? Okay. After that, Dee Dee goes into labor and every single person she's friends with rush her over to the Dr. Lipschitz Holistic Hippie Birthing Center where you can give birth outdoors in a field or underwater. Thankfully, Dee Dee is taken to a regular old hospital room to have the kid while the babies are left to wander around a birthing center like vagrants. This is where we learn that the toddlers in the Rugrats universe have the same mental faculties as Lin-Manuel Miranda. They can write a killer musical number and they're aware of their own penises. Back in the birthing suite, Stu likes the name Dylan for their fresh newborn son because his nickname sounds like the food. Dill Pickles. I like it. Tommy tries to be nice to his new brother Dill, but Dill grabs his nose like an a-hole and it's on. After four weeks of listening to crying babies scream, Dee Dee and Stu are at their wit's end. Apparently, all of their friends are total buttheads and left an entire gang of toddlers for the pickles to deal with on zero sleep. No one is taking care of these other babies. Grandpa has passed out snoring, and for some reason, they still haven't slaughtered that goat. Meanwhile, in B-Plot Town, some circus monkeys hijack a train amidst some delightful Russian puns, but we're gonna save those guys for later. Back at the house, Stu is having a full-scale mental breakdown. The Reptar toy design entry is just days away, and our boy hasn't had a wink of sleep. Dee Dee and Stu are so preoccupied with putting Dill to bed that they don't even notice that Tommy is singing sad nursery rhymes to himself in the closet. Oh crap, and they also left Spike outside in the rain? They truly are awful parents, oh my god. At this point in the movie, we start to get to know Dill a little bit better, and it quickly becomes obvious that he is not of the same mental capacity as the other infants on this show. Let's quickly review. Tommy, Phil, and Lil are all around a year old, and all of them are capable of speaking in full, slightly broken sentences. Chucky has almost completely mastered the English language, he just gets words confused, and Angelica is practically a Rhodes Scholar. Now let's think back to that Danny Elfman level of musical composing back in the nursery. 
Those kids are like minutes old and they already have a choreographed show tune. We can only assume that Dill is in fact super dumb. Back to the plot. I absolutely love hate how crazy money hungry Drew is. He admits to his daughter that he can't spend as much time with her because he's working overtime to please his power boss wife, and mocks Stu for being a loser despite the fact that Stu has been working as free childcare for Drew for the best part of the last three years. Maybe instead of harping on your brother about getting a real job, you could pay him for rearing your child, Drew. At this point, Stu is fully broken down. He gives his one-year-old son an expensive vintage pocket watch that his son carries in his diaper alongside his screwdriver and turds. Next, Bill and Lil low-key decide that they're just gonna take Dill back to the hospital, even though he is in no way related to them. Grandpa Lou sleeps through his granddaughter kicking his newborn and one-year-old grandson out the front door, onto a main street with actual cars, and the babies fly through the air in a plastic death wagon. A gangster rug rat rat plays while they drive the death wagon through a local park, onto the highway, into a mattress warehouse, and onto a delivery truck. Stu drives after them recklessly enough that he causes the mattress truck to crash and careen into the woodlands off the highway. Miraculously, the babies, including a newborn with only a partially fused skull and weak neck muscles, survive. By the way, why did the mattress truck driver run away from the crash site? You don't just run away from a mattress truck crash if the mattresses aren't full of cocaine. After Angelica rollerblades off the same cliff, a neighbor reports seeing her and Spike rollerblading on I-98. You know, a perfectly normal place for a three-year-old and a dog to be playing. In what world would you not stop your car on the freeway to rescue a toddler and her dog on wheels careening towards their death after a mattress truck full of cocaine? In the forest, the other babies are beginning to resent Tommy for exhibiting basic survival traits that would ordinarily be rewarded with a Boy Scout merit badge, but in this case, they hate him for it. He saves his brother's life over Chucky's, and now the other toddlers realize where Tommy's loyalties lie. Remember that B-plot with the monkeys in the circus train? The babies find the circus train, it's covered in clowns, and it's full of singing monkeys. Please note that the singing monkeys are about on par intelligence-wise as the baby in the maternity ward of the hospital, as they can also perform musical numbers. This means that they, too, are smarter than Dill. Of course, the monkeys try to kidnap the banana-covered Dill, and when Chucky tells Phil and Lil that he needs their help to save Dill, Phil ominously replies, So? So, Phil and Lil let the monkeys abduct Dill, then convince Chucky to go in on an elaborate plan to trick Tommy into believing Dill has become a were-monkey. But Tommy's too smart for that shiz, so his friends start Lord of the Fliesing out, setting our one-year-old hero down a lonely forest road in the rain to save his brother. Meanwhile, back at the house, Stu rebuilds a flying pterodactyl device that he thinks will help him locate his children. Instead of letting the police do their goddamn jobs, Stu straps himself into the flying dinosaur and his friend Chaz pulls him down the highway in his pickup truck. Angelica somehow still doesn't realize how crappy this situation really is and sings the go-go's in the rain. Tight. Tommy is low-key just dragging a soggy diaper bag through the mud and the rain in the forest when he spots the monkeys who have his brother. A wolf cry scares the monkeys away, but not Tommy, so he hides them under a tree. Dill keeps being an a-hole to Tommy. He eats all his food, steals and rips his blanket, and causes Tommy to fall in the mud. Like his father, it turns out that Tommy is just a few crummy seconds away from exploding into a murderous rage. He attempts to sacrifice Dill to the monkey gods while spouting a manifesto about why he shouldn't have screwed over his homies for his little bro. Just as Tommy's about to cover his brother in bananas and allow the monkey overlords to feast on his flesh, Dale reminds him of his humanity and Tommy spares the young. Back in the other baby gang, Chucky's starting to feel remorse for leaving his friends out in the rain and cold. Phil and Lil see this as a sign of weakness and they mock the boy. Tommy regains consciousness in his Bruce Banner form and remembers why he needs to take care of his baby brother. As the sun rises, Dee Dee cries, knowing that her children have likely been snatched by a pedophile. Like a total doofus, Stu is still flying the giant pterodactyl above the forest looking for his children. Just as the monkey overlords are about to descend on Tommy and Dill, Lil and Phil take a break from being the twins from The Shining and decide to save their friends. Chucky whips around the tree Fast and the Furious style in the Reptar Death Wagon, causing the primate army to disperse. For some reason, Angelica still doesn't understand that they are seriously lost in the woods with dangerous monkeys, a wolf, and sociopathic twin babies, but luckily she finds Cynthia, so I guess that's cool. She bites a monkey's tail to get her doll back, which means that she'll likely spend the next 12 weeks getting rabies shots in her stomach. Spike finds Tommy, which is cool, because if I got lost in the woods, Pugsley would literally never find me. <laughs> then Tommy and Spike save Chucky from being demolished by circus monkeys. Tommy decides to trust Phil and Lil to watch his brother, which is a terrible idea, considering how willing they were to kill him less than six hours ago. The wolf then shows up to take this baby versus monkey gladiator death match to the next level. Spike literally fights the wolf to the death, exactly like in Black Panther. 
Both canines fall off the waterfall, but in the end, Spike is victorious, making him the ruler of Wolfconda. Then the parents show up and reunite with their lost toddlers. For some reason, Howard says Betty and Daddy are here, which further leads me to believe that Howard is Betty's beard, Betty and Charlotte are lesbians, and Howard is a sperm donor that allowed them to conceive Phil and Lil. But that's a cartoon conspiracy theory for another time! So, Dee Dee Pickles gave birth without medical insurance in a swanky hippie hospital to a kid who's literally dumber than a monkey. Stu Pickles is depressed and destitute, and believes that the only way out of his family's financial ruin is to invent a reptar death wagon equipped with a flamethrower for children. Drew Pickles is happy to berate his little brother for supporting his family with contest winnings, but slow to thank Stu for providing free childcare. Phil and Lil are tiny sociopaths, and if this guy came to my baby shower, he'd be the first person I questioned when my kids went missing. But what did you guys think? Do you remember these cuddly babyos being this dark? Let us know in the comments, like and subscribe to Nerdwire, and I'll be back next week to ruin your childhood.